Your Excellency Sri Ram Nath Kovind, President of the Republic of India, Olavur Ragnar Grímsson, former President of Iceland, T. Armstrong Shangsan, Ambassador of India to Iceland, Guðmundur Árni Stefansson, Ambassador of Iceland to India, ladies and gentlemen. It is my great honor to welcome President of India Sri Ram Nath Kovind to the University of Iceland, Ola, to present a lecture entitled India, Iceland for a Green Planet. This trip to Iceland is President Kovind's first official visit to a Nordic country and it is therefore the University of Iceland's enormous privilege to be the first Nordic university he has visited. For many years, the University of Iceland has placed considerable emphasis on strong academic links with India. For example, the University of Iceland has signed cooperative agreements with Indian universities and is a member of the Nordic Center in India which was established in 2001 and is an important platform for teaching and research cooperation between its Nordic members and Indian partner institutions. This very autumn, the University of Iceland is offering Hindi as a university subject for the first time and I would like to extend my particular thanks to the current and former ambassadors of India to Iceland and the Indian government for their unwavering support in making this a reality. Finally, I would like to mention that Ola Ragnar Grímsson, former president of Iceland, who is here with us today and will give a note of thanks after President Cohen's lecture, was presented with the Java Harlal Nehru Award for international understanding in 2007 and has used the prize money to provide several Indian University students with the Nehru Grimson Fellowship to fund one semester of study in the field of glaciology and climate change at the University of Iceland. The University of Iceland warmly embraces this excellent education initiative by former President Grimson. Before I give the floor to the President of India, I would like to say a few words about our distinguished speaker. His Excellency Sri Ramnath Kovin was born on October 1, 1945 in the Kanpur Dehat district of Uttar Pradesh. He completed his junior school education in Kanpur and pursued higher education at the College Kanpur, receiving a bachelor's degree in commerce and an LLB law degree. He worked as a lawyer prior to entering politics in 1994 and served as member of parliament in the upper house of the parliament of India from 1994 to 2006. He served as the 36th governor of the state of Bihar from 2015 to 2017 before becoming the 40th 14th, 14th President of India on July 25, 2017. It is my great pleasure to welcome now His Excellency President Sri Ramnath Kovind to the podium. esteemed rector of the university, distinguished former president, Mr. Olafur Gimson, faculty members, students, ladies and gentlemen, Godan Dain and Namaskar. <laughs> I'm delighted uh, to visit your beautiful country. It is a country of warm people and spectacular landscapes. It is a country where society lives in harmony with nature. And it is a country with which India has a very special friendship. 
our two countries share many facets. We both are deeply connected to nature. We both take pride in our democracy and in our ancient cultural traditions. Your lava plains and our basaltic Deccan trap have the same genesis. We therefore belong to the same geological family as well. I thank the rector of the university for inviting me to speak with you. The esteemed university has given leadership and intellectual guidance to your democratic polity. Your president and prime minister have studied here and so have several other leaders. Mr. Olafur Grimson, former president and a great friend of India, and I say trusted friend of India, taught at this university. As students, you are indeed proud inheritors of such a rich legacy. And I am sure you will enrich it further. Ladies and gentlemen, Iceland has embraced nature like none other. It has shown unparalleled compassion to nature. I have therefore, as a tribute to your commitment, chosen to speak on the theme that is India, Iceland for a greener planet. Mother Earth today is under stress. Climate change and environmental degradation pose a huge challenge to life. The beautiful glaciers that dominate this wonderful land are receding. I have been told that Iceland loses 40 square kilometers of glacial cover annually. In my own country, we are facing rapid melting of snow on the Himalayan peaks. This threatens not just our ecosystem, but our complete way of life. I grew up on the banks of River Ganga in my native city of Kanpur. Rivers are sacred to us. They are intimately connected to our culture, our religion, and our social life. It was therefore natural for me, as with others in India and elsewhere, to develop a deep sense of reverence and respect for them. In the year 1972, it had been just over a year that I passed out my university. This was the time of the landmark United Nations Conference on Human Environment in Stockholm, which brought environment to the center of global discourse. Around the same time, we had a people's movement, that is Chipko Andolan in India, to save our trees and preserve our mountain ecology. The form of the movement was that people would embrace a tree and sit there in protest day in and day out to stop felling of trees. It was a unique expression of love for nature. A decade before that, Rachel Carson's book on environment, Silent Spring, had warned us of limitless exploitation of nature. Ladies and gentlemen, at that time, climate change was not seen as one of the most pressing concerns. But we have come a long way since then. Today we have an increasing number of global forums where we are discussing environment protection, biodiversity conservation, carbon sinks, and green growth. And yet, despite extensive knowledge on the subject, we are witness to rapidly melting glaciers and ice caps, extreme weather events, depleting marine resources, receding forests, and sinking of biodiversity. We are also equally aware of the enormous socio-economic implications of climate change, 
especially for the poor clearly increase in knowledge and availability of scientific evidence have not led to adequate practical action to deal with climate change and environmental degradation but we are on course and iceland is showing us the way as a country you have moved away from importing fossil fuels for electricity generation to producing 100% of energy from renewable sources and all this has happened in a span of a few decades what does it tell us clearly and emphatically that development and environment protection can go hand in hand through commitment and compassion through technology and timely action and through clean energy pathways and change in consumption patterns we can make a difference ladies and gentlemen iceland's green growth is a remarkable story you are pioneers in energy and resource efficiency your people have found new ways to work with available resources and then innovately scale them up to i am informed that in 1907 a farmer ran a pipe from a hot spring to his farm to provide steam to his house that idea today has led to geothermal energy revolution heating 90% of houses in iceland the manner in which iceland has pursued development in its fishery sector after collapse of its fish stock in the 1970s is worthy of emulation india and the world can benefit from iceland's expertise in sustainable fishing and fabrication of fishing fleet your waste to wealth approach in converting fish skin into leather and cosmetics also opens a whole new world of opportunities ladies and gentlemen to make the earth greener is a global challenge it requires a global response there can no longer be a path to development that does not factor in environmental considerations we are deeply conscious of it india is now the world's fastest growing major economy and we require a huge expansion of our energy production but we are doing it in a sustainable manner even as we grow we are on course to meet our commitments under the paris agreement india's greenhouse gas emission intensity of its gdp will be reduced by 33 to 35% below 2005 levels by 2030 we will be creating an additional carbon sink of 2.5 to 3 billion tons of carbon dioxide equivalent through additional forest and tree cover by 2030 we have set sorry we have set ourselves a target of installing 175 gigawatts of renewable energy capacity by the year 2022 and a target of meeting 40% of the total energy from non fossil sources by the year 2030 in our ever going commitment to renewable energy we will be turning towards utilization of geothermal energy also we look forward to working with iceland in this regard india has pledged to eliminate single use plastic by 2022 we have an ambitious target to put 6 to 7 million hybrid and electric vehicles on the road by 2020 under our national scheme ujala we have distributed 358 million led bulbs reducing 37 million tons of carbon dioxide release 
in the atmosphere. Our Ujwala program has provided 79 million clean cooking gas connections to women from poor households. This has freed rural women from the misery of toxic smoke and eliminated their dependence on firewood. Importantly, it has had a positive impact on the environment. We have taken huge steps to protect our forest cover and wildlife. India's forest cover has increased by 1% in the last five years. Our tiger population has risen 30% in the last four years and now it stands at 2967, that is 2967. Our Clean India mission is also yielding positive results for the environment to conserve water and ensure piped water availability across the country. We have undertaken an ambitious national water program. It would nourish our ecology and habitat while quenching the thirst of millions. Ladies and gentlemen, in the last few years, India has taken several steps to work with the international community to combat the effects of climate change. And as I speak, we are hosting the 14th UN Convention to combat desertification in India from 2nd to 13th September 2019. India took the initiative to launch the International Solar Alliance at the Paris Summit to enhance global action on climate change. We look forward to Iceland joining this initiative soon. Ladies and gentlemen, India's ancient books from the Vedas to the Upanishads have left us an enormous repository of knowledge and wisdom. They are guiding us to live in harmony with nature. Each year, we celebrate green festival with plantation drives involving the community and the students in our presidential state as well. On my state visits abroad also, I have planted trees from Madagascar to Myanmar and from Suriname to Vietnam to share my compassion and concern for the environment and to contribute to preserve our heritage and habitat. This year, we are celebrating the 150th birth anniversary of Mahatma Gandhi. He was an environmentalist to the core. For him, every drop of water was precious. As a practice, he would always take half a glass of water at a time and more when needed. His habit was a simple one, but with a deeper message. Hope it would encourage us all to make our life more sustainable. Dear students, you are the future leaders of our planet. You have both the knowledge and the drive to create new pathways for a greener future. The exuberance that powered the first, second and third industrial revolutions needs to be harnessed to lead the fourth revolution. This will be driven by greener technologies, clean sources of energy, and circular economy. And you will be at the forefront of all such efforts. We want our future generations to see the icy landscape that gave this beautiful country its name. Let Oko Goods be the last glacier we lose to a warming planet. And in that spirit, I call upon you to help move not just Iceland and India, but the entire planet towards a greener tomorrow. I wish you a bright future ahead. Thank you. Tak Firir. Honorable
President would like to present the book Mahatma Gandhi, A Life Through Lenses to you. Honorable President of India, distinguished uh, rector, ladies and gentlemen, let me, on behalf of all of us, uh, thank the President for this uh, inspiring and comprehensive lecture, which in many ways uh, marks uh, the transformation of India into the world of campaigning countries for a greener and safer planet. It has from the very beginning of the Indian independence campaign and through the entire history of the Republic, been the excellence of Indian leaders and statesmen to root their policies and their visions in intellectual and analytical endeavors. I don't really know of any other country where such a profound intellectual tradition has always been a condition for political, political leadership. And I think the lecture here today demonstrates once again how this largest democracy in the world can show to all of us that in the formulation of the future of the planet, we have to be guided by scientific knowledge and thinking in a progressive way. Many people might ask, what is it that connects India and Iceland? And in many ways, the future of your large country, the subcontinent of India, the most dynamic economy on the planet, and soon the largest nations and population on the planet, is profoundly affected by what happened in our northern Arctic, Arctic neighborhood. The melting of the Arctic sea ice has a profound effect on the monsoon patterns and the uh, extreme weathers that so threaten the safety of the people of India. And the melting of the Greenland ice sheet, of course, uh, will threaten the future of all the coastal cities of your great, great subcontinent. And as you mentioned in your lecture, the glaciers in the Himalayas are not only the origin of the large rivers of India, rivers that are not only great waterways, but also an essential part of the culture and the soul and the tradition of India. The Himalayan glaciers are indeed fast disappearing, like the glaciers here in Iceland. We created, as you might know, uh, Honorable President, a few weeks ago, a special memorial to a disappearing glacier, which is no, no longer with us. And in fact, the most advanced and learned glaciologists in Asia have predicted that by the middle of this century, in 30 years' time, more than half of the Himalayan glaciers will have disappeared, with colossal consequences for the food production and the livelihood of not only the people of India, but also Pakistan, Bangladesh, China, and almost the entire Asian, Asian continent. But why is the ice melting? Why is the Arctic sea ice disappearing? Why are the glaciers in Iceland and in Greenland and the Himalayas disappearing? We all know the answer. It is the fossil fuel driven economy which we in the West, in Europe and the United States created more than 100 years ago. And now has been taken over 
as a condition of economic progress by almost every country in the world. It has become a vicious circle as the increasing populations, not only in your country, but also in Asia and Africa and other parts of the world, aim for progress by using increasing amount of fossil fuel, the ice will continue to melt. And the continuing melting of the ice will have an impact on the weather patterns and the destruction and the livelihood of the people in, in Asia. We are so connected in the future of the planet that the message of your lecture, the greening of the planet, is an essential condition for our survival. But it can't be done, as you mentioned in your lecture. This country is a demonstration of how Starting by one farmer, we could gradually replace coal as a source of heating in our country with clean energy geothermal, house by house, street by street, district by district, until the entire country had been transformed. And as I sometimes tell my Indian friends, it was never a grand plan. We didn't do it because we were climate visionaries. We did it because it was good business. And that is, I think, the extraordinary contribution that India has in recent years under the new leadership made to the world of clean energy transformation, emphasizing that it is indeed good business. It makes profound economic sense, making India now one of the largest and fast growing solar power countries in the world, creating soon, as your prime minister said, a few years ago, the OPEC of solar power, replacing the OPEC of oil, led by India. But also, if I may ask you to take the message back to India, India is also like Iceland rich in geothermal power. You have the possibility all over India to heat and especially cool your cities by following the Icelandic geothermal model. And let's not forget that last year, seven million people died from pollution in cities. Seven million people directly. It is the fourth largest killer in the world. Unfortunately, a high proportion of them in India, China, and other Asian countries. So the transformation over to clean energy and green planet is also an issue of life and death of health and the future we give to our children. And let me thank you for having come to Iceland and decided to provide this message of how we together must aim and work diligently and fast towards a green planet because otherwise, my dear friends, we will all be doomed. It's not a prediction put forward lightly. It is, unfortunately, a scientific conclusion of the path we are on. And for the President of India to come here today and give us the message he has just delivered is for those of us who have followed your extraordinary country for a long time, a strong evidence of the revolutionary change towards a green planet and green energy that India has executed in recent years. So thank you very much for being with us here today. Thank you profoundly for your message. And let it be the beginning of an even more extensive cooperation between our countries in these areas. Thank you.